My name is Rajesh Thadani. Um, I did my doctoral work at the forestry school at Yale on the oak pine ecosystem in the Himalaya, in the central Himalaya, after which I went back to India and worked in a grassroots NGO called the Central Himalayan Rural Action Group, or CHIRAG in short, which worked in about 150 villages uh, across the central Himalaya. I'm currently associated with an organization called CEDA, or the Center for Ecology, Development and Research. And uh, our objective is to do applied uh, research, uh, which is of relevance either for policymakers or for grassroots NGOs in the Himalaya. Uh, I've always been fascinated with the Himalaya. I spent some time there as a kid. My father used to work in the Himalaya. And uh, it is the largest uh, physical feature in, in India and is responsible for the climate of North India as well as uh, essential for the livelihoods of about a billion people that live in the Indo-Gangetic Plains uh, due to the ecosystem services provided by it. Um, it's also a nice place to walk and trek in and, and, and a very beautiful place, uh, one of the easier and nicer places to do field work. In. The Himalaya has for millennia been well populated. Uh, at present, there is over extraction of biomass products, which would mean fuel wood, fodder, fertilizer, which are products that are used to support the agro ecosystem. The nutrient input is not through chemical fertilizers, but it is largely through leaf litter, which is swept up from the forest. Uh, people use firewood for energy. And uh, the cattle, which is an integral part of the agroecosystem, uh, are fed leaves, which are usually lopped, or uh, the branches of trees that are pruned from the forest. Um, this has resulted in some level of overextraction, uh, which has had deleterious impacts on the Himalayan forest. Um, in the northeastern part of the Himalaya, a certain amount of timber extraction still continues, which is a problem. But uh, in the central Himalaya, it is largely uh, what we call a chronic disturbance, a low intensity, continuous disturbance, uh, which is a threat to the forest. In addition, uh, global warming now is proving to be a bit of a problem because it appears to have changed the climatic patterns a bit. Uh, which means that agricultural patterns have had to change. Uh, crops that used to grow at a particular elevational range don't do as well any longer. Uh, we seem to be getting more intense storms, um, more intense rainfall events, uh, which have had uh, impacts. Um, there is a change in the flora and fauna and, and insects, which, which never used to occur, and fungal diseases, which never used to occur, uh, seem to be occurring in some parts. India has for a long time had a huge shortage of power. The easiest, uh, supposedly greenest way to generate more power is through hydro hydropower. And uh, there has been the building of a large number of hydropower projects across the Himalaya. Many more are still planned. Um, however, the Himalaya are in a fairly seismically active zone. It's, it's called a zone 5, which is the highest level of seismicity. Um, also, the mountains are relatively young. They are they're well under 60 million years old, which in geological terms is uh, very, very recent. They're still growing taller, so it's, it's, it's very youthful mountains, and as a result are extremely crumbly. Uh, situating large dams, or more commonly now what are called run-of-the-river projects, which are uh, uh, basically large pipelines which are bored through mountains and, and then give an adequate head to generate hydropower um, is extremely risky in, in such uh, environments. Uh, if seismic activity occurs, which it will eventually, uh, it could lead to uh, problems in these hydropower projects. Um, hydropower is also resulting in changes in the diversity. Um, it is resulting in, in wildlife corridors being impacted. Uh, there is a lot of relocation of human beings which needs to happen because as mountain systems go, the Himalaya are fairly well populated. The 
The uh, Himalaya has often been studied for the north-south transects, the very, very sudden changes in elevation from about sea level to uh, 8,000 meters or more in a very, very short distance. However, what's equally interesting or more interesting and what we are looking at through the El Himalaya Initiative is the east-west arc or the east-west transect uh, from Afghanistan and Pakistan in the west to Burma in the east. And along this gradient, you have a, a large variety of um, environmental, social, and cultural gradients. You go from uh, dry desert-like conditions in the west to the wettest spot on earth in Cherapunji in the eastern Himalaya. You go from um, uh, very tropical forests with a very, very tropical trait, even at mid-elevational zones, to forests which have a much more uh, temperate uh, trait. You find the entire spectrum of religions. Uh, most of the major religions of the planet are well represented in the Himalaya. It's, it's, it's unusual to see such a small area with um, all these various uh, religions, Christianity, Buddhism, Islam, Hinduism, coexisting and coexisting fairly well in many places. Um, you have uh, very high endemism, which is uh, species that are sort of unique to the area among the western uh, side of the Himalaya, whereas on the east you have extremely high biodiversity and it's, it's considered one of the biodiversity hotspots um, of the earth. Um, the Himalaya is also uh, the uh, sort of land from where many major rivers flow and 10 major river basins get a lot of their water from the Himalayan region and the ecosystem services that flow from the Himalaya impact about a fifth of humanity, over a billion people in the Indo-Gangetic plains, uh, in the plains of Punjab and uh, further north in Tibet and China. Biodiversity, species, animals, plants uh, don't recognize political borders and uh, they move whether the borders are there or not. What's interesting is that people also don't recognize political borders to the extent that we might think they do. Um, the indigenous groups there will often cross borders which are thought to be extremely hostile and disputed um, without really uh, thinking too much about it. Um, yes, certainly uh, with uh, the uh, several of the countries uh, in the Himalayan zone getting into conflict, borders have become a lot less porous than they used to be. Uh, but the movement across borders still occurs, um, both for the flora and fauna, uh, but also for human beings and a certain amount of trade that still goes on. In uh, the U.S., when we talk about forest disturbance, the focus is usually more on what we call acute disturbance, uh, clear-cutting of forests, or even thinning of stands, which results in the removal of a fair number of trees. In the western Himalaya in particular, uh, the disturbance is different. We call it chronic disturbance. Um, it is something that happens repeatedly, but is of a much lower intensity. The agroecosystem, which, uh, which, which forms the main uh, livelihood uh, pattern of the local people there, uh, is very dependent on uh, these biomass products, which would be uh, wood, which is not uh, obtained through the cutting of entire trees, but rather the lopping of branches. Um, leaf litter, which is obtained by sweeping the forest floor clean off leaves that fall uh, once a year. That's a very interesting pattern of uh, the Himalayan trees, the western Himalayan trees. Most of them lose their leaves um, after 12 months of, of getting them, and almost all of them lose their leaves in the spring, in, in March and April. And after that, uh, women from villages correct, collect these headloads of leaves and take them out of the forest. Um, Fodder is also obtained largely from the forest. And interestingly enough, in this ecosystem, people lop the trees, uh, remove leaves from high branches, um, and, and take them to feed to their cattle. Uh, whereas if you move from the western part of the Himalaya, uh, cattle and buffaloes, uh, are, are really the main uh, livestock that are present there. And they are integral to the agricultural systems. In the past, they were the only source of 
uh, draft power. They, they were used to plow the fields. Um, you still cannot have much mechanization on those slopes, so you still need um, ox when you want to plow your fields. Um, the, um, interestingly, the cattle dung that comes from these uh, um, uh, cows was used to form the main fertilizer for the fields. It was composted along with the leaf litter, and that was the main nutrient input. But as we go east, uh, you moved into a different kind of agricultural practice. You had shifting uh, agriculture or slash and burn agriculture, as it's known, where the trees would all be cut down, uh, the stubble would be burnt, uh, the area would be cultivated for two or three years, and then the ecosystem would be left to recover for a period of five to 15 or 20 years. Um, in those areas, the importance of cattle is much less. Um, but meat becomes extremely important. And uh, piggery is, is the main um, uh, livestock that you find in the eastern Himalaya. Biogas is an extremely interesting technology which hasn't got the importance that it should be getting in the western Himalaya. We carry out afforestation programs there with the hope that the forest will come back. But unless the local people there have an option, have alternatives to firewood, uh, you cannot have forests coming back. Um, liquid petroleum gas, which is used along the roadhead, is not very practical to get into the interior parts of uh, the Himalaya. And biogas forms an extremely important and interesting alternative um, to fuel wood. Uh, what happens with biogas is that the dung or cow dung is mixed with water, made into a slurry, uh, put into a large chamber, which is airtight, which is built for this purpose, and left to ferment. Methane gas is released, uh, which forms an extremely clean fuel, which can be used for cooking. The residue that is left, the slurry, which, which is uh, uh, reduced in carbon content, which comes out as methane gas, uh, still has all the nutrients in it. So it makes an extremely effective fertilizer. All the pathogens and, and uh, nematodes and other things uh, in the slurry are killed through the biogas process. So it's a, it's a very good fertilizer, more nutritious and, and with much less in terms of uh, disease. Uh, the other good thing with biogas is that it's a clean fuel. Um, at present, there's a lot of attention that's been focused to what we call black carbon, small residues, particles of carbon, which get into the upper atmosphere, largely as a result of biomass burning, uh, burning uh, dirty fuel woods which have moisture in them in particular. And uh, this black carbon gets into the upper atmospheric layers, it forms a haze, it gets deposited on the glaciers in the Himalaya, which increases uh, the, the ability of the glaciers to absorb sunlight and uh, increases the rate of melt of glaciers. So it's a really serious problem. When you use biogas, you don't get black carbon to that extent. So again, it's, it's better for the environment. It's better uh, also, of course, for the local villagers who use it because the respiratory and eye ailments, which tend to be very, very high amongst women who cook on uh, wood uh, fuels, uh, is much, much lower when they're using biogas. However, biogas has not found uh, the kind of acceptability or has not spread as well as we would have hoped. The major issue we see with biogas is the high upfront costs. Um, a one to two cubic meter biogas plant, which is what would be required for a for a typical family, which would be five or six people, would cost about 10 to 15,000 rupees or about uh, $300 or so uh, to construct. Um, this represents a fairly large amount of money for uh, rural people, and um, it is one reason why it doesn't get uh, built as often as it should. However, the savings from biogas in terms of um, carbon sequestration that occurs when you're not uh, burning so much wood in terms of impacts on health, in terms of impact on, on overall global warming and black carbon would be worth a lot more than $300. So this would be what I'd call a good subsidy, even if we have to uh, pay people most of the amount they need to build a biogas plant, it would be well worth it. 
Um, a few other problems with biogas also include um, it requires a little bit of water. So where acute water shortages occur, it doesn't work that well. And you need some trained technicians. So while the level of engineering expertise is very, very basic to keep a biogas plant functional, if people don't have that, you often have the pipelines getting clogged with a little bit of water maybe. And, and just because people don't know how to drain it, um, it, it ceases to function. The Himalayan ecosystem is also extremely interesting to study for things like chronic disturbance or for, for other kinds of studies uh, because the uh, flora, the, the large trees there, um, are relatively uh, lacking in diversity, which makes it easy to model this ecosystem, for example. Um, we have mainly two species at the mid-elevational range, which exists over much of the Himalaya. Uh, these are the oaks and the pines, and you have a few species of oak and largely one species of pine. Um, human disturbance tends to increase the distribution of pine over oak because oak has a fuel wood which has extremely high calorific value, so it's preferred for burning. The leaves of oak um, are relatively nutritious. It's not a great fodder, but it's the most available fodder, so the tree tends to be lopped uh, by humans. And finally, the leaf litter is extremely nutritious again and, and forms a much better compost than uh, most other kinds of trees. In most trees, when the leaf is about to fall, there's a high retranslocation of nutrients back into the tree. And the leaf that falls actually has fairly low levels of nitrogen and phosphorus and other nutrients. In uh, Quercus leucotrichophora and other Himalayan oaks, there is a fairly high level of nutrients that is left in the leaves. In other words, the reed translocation is low. What this does is that the leaves that fall uh, onto the forest floor are rich in nutrients, they rot more easily, um, and the nutrients goes back into the forest soils and then can be reabsorbed by the trees. So you have an external uh, mode of, of um, a nutrient uh, movement rather than the, than the tree, tree just uh, bringing the uh, leaves back. But as a result of its utility to the local people, uh, banj oak or the other oaks in the Himalaya tend to be lopped much more. Um, they are more susceptible to fire in that uh, seedlings tend to be damaged more than the seedlings of pine would be damaged. Uh, they tend to be grazed more, so when cattle are left in the forest, uh, oak seedlings tend to be impacted more. And all of these together result in the distribution of pine vis-a-vis -vis oak increasing, uh, which actually is converse to what normally happens. You normally have oak uh, taking over from pine, but because of human disturbance, uh, pine often takes over from oak in the Himalaya. So when we think of the Himalaya, we think of these high snow-capped mountains, and uh, rightly so. Pretty much all the highest peaks in the world are in the Himalaya. But when we actually look at uh, a, a section of the Himalaya, it's not all snow-capped peaks. Um, the Himalaya rises fairly suddenly to about 2,000 meters, uh, but after that it stays at about that elevation for some 150 kilometers or so and varies from 1500 to maybe two and a half thousand meters after which it suddenly rises up to six or seven thousand meters. Now <clears throat> what this does is, is something interesting in that the, there is a broad expanse of land about 150 kilometers in depth in the southern Himalaya which is extremely suitable for uh, human settlements as well as forests. These forests have extremely high productivity. This is the zone of oak and pine uh, mixed with some amount of um, alder and poplar and maples, um, actually not very different from the kind of ecosystem in terms of species that you would expect uh, in, in the northeast US, but very, very different species, endemic species that have extremely different characteristics. Uh, the oaks, for example, are evergreen. Uh, they are not deciduous. 
they don't form very good rings. The pines have a lower leaf life span than in, in the pines you would see in the US. Uh, the needles uh, fall after about uh, 12 months or so, giving the pine a almost deciduous kind of characteristic. And, and in the spring, you'll see the pine trees with relatively uh, few needles as the old needles fall and the new ones have not yet fully expanded. So you have this very broad expanse of the Himalaya, which has high productivity, high settlements, um, a fairly dense population. And this is the zone that, that makes for um, a lot of interesting study, whether you are a sociologist, an anthropologist, an ecologist, um, or just um, looking at an, an integration of all of these things. Most of the trees in the Himalayan ecosystem uh, lose their leaves in the spring. And uh, these leaves actually turn out to be an extremely valuable resource for human beings. Um, the oak leaves, for example, are used to make a compost fertilizer after mixing them with cow dung. And this is the main nutrient input for Himalayan agriculture in the Western Himalaya or Central Himalaya. Uh, the pine leaves are also fairly useful. They're used for packing of uh, the horticultural fruit, uh, so packing of apples. Uh, they're also being used for briquetting now to produce uh, energy. But all of this has a fairly um, significant impact on the ecosystem, which is not extremely well studied and uh, not very well thought out uh, as well. Government policies do not uh, condone in any way the removal of leaf litter and in fact encourage uh, the removal of uh, pine litter because uh, it is thought to uh, cause the ground fires. Um, at Cedar we've started looking at the impacts of leaf litter removal and, and they're fairly significant. Um, of course soil compaction occurs so you have a more dense, uh, more compacted soil where germination of species is, is impacted. Um, the Soil biota gets extremely impacted from mycorrhizae. Uh, mycorrhizae are these associations between, beneficial associations between fungi and, and uh, plant roots, which help increase the volume of soil that can be accessed uh, by the plant roots. And our studies found that 95% or more uh, decrease in mycorrhiza in areas where leaf litter removal was very common. The fine roots in the upper layers decrease. Uh, the soil carbon decreases. Uh, the soil is also a huge repository of carbon. And in the surficial layers in a good oak forest, you can have more than 3% carbon. But once the forest gets a bit degraded, leaf litter is removed for many, many years, um, the soil carbon levels fall to under 1%. Um, now, this has huge impacts on, on what kind of species will generate there, regenerate there. It also has a lot of uh, impact on the diversity of uh, the ground layer, the herbaceous layer that exists there, as well as uh, one thing which again hasn't been studied very well at all is the soil biota, the nematodes, the earthworms, the various kinds of uh, small critters that live in the soil layers. And these of course are extremely impacted. The Himalaya, by definition almost, um, um, have problems to start with. Uh, it's, it's like an adolescent kid when, when you know, you're 15 years old, you tend to have more than your fair share of problems. And I'd say it's, it's similar with the Himalaya. There are young and growing mountain range, um, which is uh, very fragile, where many of the rocks uh, tend to be very crumbly. Uh, where seismic activity is already very high. Um, so it's, it's not a very stable mountain range, um, such as the mountain ranges, uh, such as the Alps, for example, which tend to be an old and stable mountain range. Um, the high population that has been living there has resulted in the fragmentation of the natural areas. And as global warming occurs, and global warming, interestingly enough, seems to be occurring faster or at a, at a more accentuated rate in the Himalaya, the glaciers seem to be melting a little faster. Um, the uh, climate change across uh, the slope seems to be higher. Uh, it is impacting the way the natural flora and fauna can move, especially now that human beings have sort of uh, taken over patches of the landscape and the corridors for migration of that flora and fauna have been greatly cut down. Um, so the Himalaya faces threats on several fronts. 
Um, another major one is the development activity. Um, we all want electricity, and so hydropower needs to be built. Um, but is hydropower, our large dams, or even run-of-the-river dams appropriate for the Himalaya? Uh, there's a lot of road-building activity going on without proper alignment. Once you disturb a fragile uh, rock, uh, it's often very, very hard to stabilize it. And roads that are built incorrectly will result in landslips and landslides that go on for years to come. So there are problems on, on many different levels in the Himalaya. Um, the Himalaya makes an extremely interesting research area. And uh, in some ways, it's easy to study the tree diversity, for example, in the Western Himalaya is relatively low. But what makes it so interesting and complex is the interplay of nature, uh, geology, ecology, forestry, and uh, human beings. Um, unlike other forested ecosystems in the world, you don't have large swaths of forest and then uh, you know, human populations on, on the periphery of that. Human beings integrate very, very well with the natural areas. They're dependent on the natural areas of these forests, and pretty much all the forests are impacted by human beings in one way or the other. Uh, studying this interplay of uh, humans and nature and wildlife uh, is extremely interesting. The Himalaya has also been called the third pole. Um, in addition to the North and South Pole, uh, why do we call the Himalaya Pole? Well, that's because uh, they've also been called the Water Towers of Asia. Uh, that's because there's an amazing amount of snow and ice and glaciers that exist in the Himalaya. This has very important implications for the world. If global warming uh, makes those glaciers melt faster than glaciers elsewhere, um, it is going to have implications, not just for global climate, not just for changes in albedo and reflectivity, but for the one billion people or more that live in the Indo-Gangetic and other major basins of the Himalaya. But the point is here that the study of these glaciers or other aspects of the Himalayan ecosystem is much lower than what we would have liked. Um, a recent IPCC report called the Himalaya a white spot because of the paucity of research that exists on many areas. So this is an ecosystem that really requires a lot more attention and a lot more research.